Welcome, everybody. I think we're going to get started now. If you can, um, if you'd like to turn on your video for a minute just to say hi, it'd be great to see you. Otherwise, you can also introduce yourself in the chat. Um, we're really excited to have such a great turnout this evening. Um, and uh, just if you haven't met me or received, Emails or anything from me. My name is Stephen Taranto. I'm the coordinator of CESA's climate program. And uh, we have a few other folks here from CESA tonight, including Molly Funk, who is one of our workshop wizards. If you have any tech issues, uh, you can let Molly know uh, somehow. And also wanted to um, just mention that this is our first um, event of our annual uh, Adapt Your Farm to Climate Change webinar and workshop series. Uh, so this will be the first in a series of events this year that the climate program is hosting. And our theme this year is on-farm adaptation. So we're really going to be zeroing in on farms in our area that are putting into practice uh, some type of adaptation uh, to our changing climate. Uh, so at some point tonight, um, we'll share a slide with some other events that are coming up in the series. And we'll be giving you some links where you could sign up right away. And one of those will include an on-farm um, visit to Sawyer Farm, where our guest tonight, Lincoln Fishman, Lincoln Fishman has been laboring away with an adaptation practice for the last few years uh, that we'll hear about tonight. Uh, also, as far as questions go, um, please use the raise your hand option if you know how to use that. And also, um, you can put your questions in the chat. And Molly and I will be fielding those and either passing them right along to Lincoln in the moment or uh, saving them for the right moment. Uh, and there, we do have an hour and a half tonight. Uh, so there will be some time for discussion and question at the end. So you can just not jot down your questions if you want to uh, have more time towards the towards the end this evening. All right. So with that said, I'd like to introduce our uh, guest tonight, Lincoln Fishman from Sawyer Farm. Uh, Lincoln, uh, as he's going to explain um, in a few moments, uh, has been working on. Uh, um, uh, an adaptation project that in a very small part has been supported by CESA's adaptation grants. And I just want to let everybody know uh, that CESA does offer adaptation grants up to $3,000 for farms uh, who are trying to get some uh, help either designing or otherwise um, putting into practice um, adaptations uh, on their farm. And so if that's something that's of interest to anybody, I would encourage you to get in touch with me. Uh, my email will be put into the chat later on, and you can uh, just get a hold with me that way. We'll have a very initial brief conversation about your project ideas, and then there's also a, a relatively brief application process. Uh, so that is open to folks in our catchment area. And uh, so keep that in mind as you see what folks like Lincoln are doing with, with a little bit of this support. All right. So with that said, Lincoln, welcome. Uh, looking forward to hearing what you're up to out at Sawyer Farm. And Thanks. so take it away. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks everybody for showing up. I appreciate it. Um, so let's see, if I do screen sharing, are you all gonna be able to see my face as well? Or that's yes. not how it works? Yeah, we can set that up. All right, cool. Do you wanna tell me what to do or you do it? I'm just gonna um, change the view to speaker view and and everyone should be able to see you on the right side of their screen. Great. All right, I'm gonna jump right in. So um, this is uh, crop production in perennial clover living mulch. Um, I think, you know, a bunch of you probably have seen this before. So I'm trying to change it up a little bit, but a lot of the first slides are gonna be Similar if you've seen me at workshops um, or conferences or whatever, um, but there's some different stuff too, so, um, so hang in there. So 
I thought this is an interesting series. I'm excited to be part of it. Um, I also think I just wanted to start with a little bit of like definition of terms, because I think you can take adaptation two ways, um, which is how are we adapting our farms to withstand climate change or, or to help address climate change? And those are two really different things. And mostly we're talking about withstand, but um, I feel like it's really important as we figure out how to make these changes to change in a way that um, also helps mitigate the problem to some extent. Otherwise, we're just um, kind of recreating it. So I, I think a lot of times when we talk about drought and flood and our solutions are, you know, putting in tons more infrastructure um, to handle these kinds of precipitation swings that we're seeing, we need to stop and ask ourselves whether we should use um, fossil fuel intensive um, solutions to a fossil fuel problem. So um, part of what we've been looking to do on our farm is, is find sol solutions that can kind of answer both questions, which is make us a little more resilient, but also um, do our teeny weeny part in, um, in trying to make a change, um, uh, a positive change climate wise. So a lot of times these adaptation conversations, tillage reduction comes up. Tillage reduction is like such a hot word right now, a little phrase. Um, and I think everybody wants to do it without really thinking through what it is, what it means and why you wanna do it. So um, I, this is the first time I'm gonna start a talk with this slide. Um, and I guess I'm doing it just because it's almost like, I'm like, all right, this is a tillage reduction system, living mulch. Um, I think the way to sort of judge which system you like, what you think might work for you is really about sitting down and, and thinking about what your goals are. So tillage reduction is just a means to an end. We're not just, reducing tillage is not like, okay, that's the whole point. It's supposed to do something. So asking yourself what problem you're trying to solve. I think there's practical goals. Um, so tillage reduction might help you address erosion, nutrient retention, that kind of thing. Or these more philosophical things, I love the word philosophical, but we'll stick with it for now because that's what I wrote, um, which would be, you know, these kind of like bigger set of, of goals that we have, like taking atmospheric carbon and putting it back into the soil. So for us, perennial clover meets our farm's pretty specific goals, which was to reduce erosion. We're farming on a slope. I'll get into it a little bit to reduce inputs, which is important to me, both on the level of um, uh, you know, an economic level and also on a fossil fuel level, uh, you know, just because any input that comes into your farm has a footprint somewhere else, right? Um, and I want to reduce labor um, and um, planning. That's like a personal thing. I just, I got frustrated. I'm going to get into this too with a lot of tillage reduction stuff that just requires a sort of a lot of nitty gritty, like nitpicky planning that can really shift um, from year to year. And I want to increase biodiversity, which I sort of feel like is the best indicator um, of whether what I'm doing is a positive thing for the planet. So trying to reintegrate my farm into the ecosystem. So the my sort of vision statement here for the farm is um, blocked somewhat by the screen thing, but I think it says something like, to manage a diverse ecosystem that produces food with as little labor, and as few inputs as possible. Just very briefly about the farm. If people have questions that are relevant to the farm, that's fine and you can stick them in the chat box, but I'm gonna really keep it very minimal here. So we're at 1600 feet in Western Mass. So we're a lot colder than the Valley. Um, it's rocky, it's poorly drained and it's sloped. Uh, so there's a reason that, um, that you know farmers left here in the early 1800s and never came back. Um, but here we, here we are farming. <laughs> we do five acres of vegetables and they're mostly low value storage crops. We don't have a you know, great market for, um, for summer perishables, partially because we're later to market than everybody in the Valley. And partially we're just far enough that that stuff can be hard to move. So a lot of storage crops. Um, the upsides though, it's not all bad news is that um, we have no mortgage on the farm and we have very few employees. We kind of have like a, a a, a weird um, little crew of people that helps out for very little money. Or, I don't know. It's, um, so we have a sort of a, a relatively free hand financially or less stress financially than I think a lot of farms are under. 
Um, our sales are divided about equally between our farm store, um, hemp sales, we have our own little like CBD bottles and uh, wholesale storage vegetable sales. Another sort of thing we have going for us is that we don't have any farming neighbors. Um, so we don't have to be embarrassed when we do stupid things. And uh, that sounds like it's not a big deal, but it really is because as you go forward with any of these experiments, you know, you, you have some, some failures. It hurts when they're really public. Um, and uh, I don't know, it's just an ego thing. Anyway, I, I do think it, it has somewhat in a weird way made a difference that, yeah, that there's nobody to be like, what the hell are they doing over there at Sawyer? So for us, erosion is what got us started into tillage reduction stuff in general and looking for other solutions. I think when I took this photo, I was feeling pretty proud of myself. We used horses for a decade. We only had a tractor for two years. Um, I was like, we're using horses, so we're not using fossil fuels. Um, you can see this is a nice winter killed oats peas cover. And I had like kind of minimally dissed it in, it looks like. I don't know, some early brassicas or onions were going to go here. And I have these contour beds. You can't tell, but there's a that slope is, is significant. Um, so we were, we're raising these beds on contour and using homemade manure. Um, so I think I probably snapped this photo being like, that's great. I look at it now, I see a lot of dead bare soil where stuff should be growing. Um, and uh, at that time, I think the only thing I was aware of is just like, okay, there's this erosion problem that I'm not solving with all these other pieces. Um, and this is related to climate stuff because, you know, 10 years ago, our worst rainfall events were in the spring and that still happens. But over the last five years or so, we really reliably are getting the tail end of hurricanes coming up the coast here and dumping on us in fall. And that's when I was getting cover crops established. I really didn't have anything. It was often like post harvest and then, but your cover crops still only like, you know, coming up out of the ground and it's not doing what it needs to do to keep the soil in place. So really trying to come up with ways to have no bare soil in the fall. So we played with all these different tillage reduction systems. Um, and um, sorry, the, the, way, the way this thing is laid out, Molly, I assume there's no way to move it off my screen. Is it blocking everybody's view of the right hand screen? Um, I think it's specific to your screen and you should be able to like pick it up and drag it. Sure. No way. If it's, if it's the, uh, I believe you. <laughs> oh, I should be able to pick it up and drag it. You say, well, I don't know if I can figure that out. Sorry, everyone. I'm an expert at computers, but let me try making you not a host and see if that helps with your view. Then you won't be able to see my screen though, right? I think that you should, well, you'll still be able, we'll still be able to see your screen. Um, okay. Let's see. Anyway, I can keep talking. I basically know what I wrote. Um, so we tried, we've tried these five systems and we wanted them to do um, the following things. We wanted it to be practical and easy. Um, it needed to be scalable or I wanted it to be scalable. Um, not that we're so large scale, but we do do larger blocks of plantings of low value stuff. So, um, you know, a lot of the options that were out there that maybe would make sense if we made a lot of money off of salad mix or something, which is high value per square foot, just weren't going to be solutions for us. Um, and also with all this experimenting, you know, I'm doing this webinar and whatever else, I'm hoping that those of us who are like, you know, hot and heavy into this experimentation are doing something that's really valuable to other people. Um, so scalability is important to me. It has to be economical, obviously, um, otherwise it doesn't work. And then I want it to reduce emissions, increase soil C, the carbon and biodiversity. So these two in red, the rye and the winter kill cocktails, we just haven't had any luck with. For us, rye hits anthesis, like in that first or second week of June, we can't totally rely on when that's gonna happen. Um, I sometimes have a great stand. I sometimes don't have a great stand. I won't really know until that season. So what if I have a bad stand? I was really counting on it. There was just, I ended up feeling like these annuals were um, just too, too fussy for me to just really like count 
on them to work for my system. And I know there are people out there having success with Rye and, and that's totally great. I'm not, if it works for you, that's awesome. I couldn't get it to work. Same with winter killed cocktails. Um, I was never really had enough biomass to get me through enough of a weed free period where my crop was up and running. Um, so mostly what I had was a lot of residue that was getting clogged in a cultivator and was a pain in the ass. Um, transferred mulch and tarping I've got in yellow there because they work. They're just limited to what, um, you know, to how applicable they are to a wide variety of crops. And they're both, in my experience, not really scalable. So the transferred mulch, I'm not going to, it's, I'm not going to bother explaining that whole system, but basically it's like at least a 10 to one ratio, uh, or sorry, a, around a 10 to one ratio, I'd say of pasture, um, that gets cut for hay to mulch our beds. I mean, I, some that's okay for some people. If you're really land rich, um, that works, but, uh, it's again, not really a, a scalable solution. And then you've got this whole issue of transplanting into that, which is, I haven't figured out a way to mechanize that in order to have that mulch thick enough to actually reduce all your weeds. Um, you know, you're, you're just dealing with something that I, I can't even imagine what the machine would look like that would be able to go through and transplant into that. And then obviously direct seeded stuff is out of the question. So um, I like that system for certain things in certain areas of the farm, but uh, it's not something we're putting a lot of effort into. Tarping is the same deal. I mean, it's great because growing things on plastic is like easy. Um, and we have a nice system now where the tarps stay in the field all the time so they don't have to get put in the shed and they flop around and a whole thing. But it's based on plastic. I'm not convinced that, um, that the solution that we're looking for is going to be based on plastic. And I kind of would hate to see it scaled up because um, it would just mean uh, a factory somewhere was producing, you know, uh, square miles of, of plastic. Um, but you know, it has its place. And again, on, on some smaller scale farms, um, or not smaller scale, but where that they have that high value crop, um, I could see this being a good solution. There's lots of, um, lots of resources out there for people who are interested in more information about any of these first four. Um, so we wound up thinking about this living mulch. Um, it has a lot of the same benefits that that rye theoretically does, which is that you're growing this thing in place. So there's really not an input aside from the seed, right? Um, and um, I will now, nope, not yet. <laughs> I will now say one more thing about the uh, clover. So the kind of concept for us grew because we'd been under sowing this Dutch white clover. I was talking about trying to get rid of that bare soil in fall. Um, the solution we came up with was basically almost everything on the farm was getting under sown with Dutch white clover in July. So there was no cover cropping establishment, no tillage to get that cover crop established and no bare soil post harvest anymore. And I really love this. If you walk away from this webinar with like one thing, um, if the planting into clover and all that is too weird for you, um, I really encourage you to think about under sowing clover. Uh, this was just an easy, easy solution for us for years. And yes, it doesn't make as much biomass as other cover crops. It doesn't give you as much N as a taller growing clover type would. But um, the fact is it's on the ground with its roots in the ground. It's photosynthesizing. It's holding the soil in place. It's providing pollinator habitat. It's doing all this great stuff from July all the way through when you terminate it the next spring. And it's easy to terminate. Um, so that was our system for many, many years. And then we wondered, you know, could we, could we plant into it? So this photo right here is just rye that got established under some field corn. We grow a little bit of field corn for cornmeal for the farm store. Um, and, and so that was, that clover would have been sown in early July. And, uh, and then this photo is October 15th. I'll talk all about under sowing later on. Um, when I say clover, I'm only going to mean Dutch white clover in this, uh, but you'll see clover, 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 clover. It always means Dutch white clover. It's a low growing clover and it's got a good balance between being, it's aggressive, so it suppresses weeds, but because its growth is so low, 
it doesn't mess with your plants too much. And that's the whole trick with these living mulches. So this is that same spot. You can see the, the corn stover there. This is that same spot the following spring. So at this point, we would normally have disked it in and now we're leaving it. That's a picture of the bulb auger in the upper right-hand corner when we were just sort of doing this experimentally. Um, we were just using that bulb auger. You can buy them on Amazon for like 15 bucks. I'll talk about those a little more later too. And I'll talk about this transplanter later, which is what we use now. So now I just show you some photos to prove that things actually grow in a, in a clover sod, which is very counterintuitive. Here's some uh, storage number four that's getting transplanted. Uh, 616. There it is two weeks later. Not doing much, but the clover is grown in. See how ugly the furrow is here um, that the transplanter is making? I'll talk about that later too. Um, but it, it grows back in pretty quickly. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, that's a field of cabbage. And there we were at harvest. Uh, we did a few test plots, but the one that was irrigated and fertilized shockingly did the best, um, better than the unirrigated uh, sections, the unfertilized sections. So we got like 30,000 pounds an acre, which is equivalent to what we would get. I'm not saying that's not like amazing yields, but that's for us equivalent to what we would get on bare soil. And here it is post harvest. I just brush hog it down to put the residue down on the ground and let the clover canopy back in. Um, that's really nice. That's what I want to see post harvest. This is right when we're getting all these rains is 100% cover there. Here's some delicata squash, um, teeny weeny. You actually have to look to see it. You'll see the cotyledons are all yellowed out. It looks pretty bad and it's smaller than the clover. At this point in the season, you're like, this is so stupid, this is not gonna work. And then here you're like, this, this is not working. This is almost like, where's Waldo? And then right before it starts to run, we mow it one more time with a lawnmower now alongside and it does well. Um, we had good yields on it. I didn't have any delicata in bare soil this year, so I can't say side by side, but I was you know, looking at the wagon that we harvest onto from the size that it was, um, you know, it was in the zone um, uh, yield wise. Broccoli did well, brassicas, late brassicas just do well. These tomatoes did well, they yielded a little bit later then my tomatoes on black plastic, I attribute it to soil temperatures, but I have no idea. I could be wrong. But once they came in, the yields were equivalent. Uh, this was direct seeded. Um, this was direct seeded dry beans. Um, and uh, I'll get it. Oh, boy. I hope I added those slides to this. We'll see later on um, about uh, direct seeding. This was my only experiment direct seeding. I was kind of shocked that it worked. I um, put these beans in and then I mowed the clover off with a lawnmower right on top of them uh, at germination. And they did beautiful. These actually did better than my bare soil uh, dry beans. It works great with hemp because hemp will grow anywhere. Lincoln, we had a question about the delicata or yeah. any, other, any other squash ripening up in the clover. Uh, that's from Ben, if you want to clarify. Yeah, what do you, what do you, oh, like because the sun's not shining on the fruit? Yeah, you got it. Um, you know, I was worried about it. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. There they are. Um, I'm not sure how much has to do with direct sunlight or not. You know, I've only really been able to experiment with delicata. It's cold where we are. I have trouble, like even with butternut, getting like fully ripe butternuts um, in our short season. Um, so some of the trials, which I'll talk about that other farms are gonna be doing, um, are gonna be looking at squash. I think um, anybody who's a little bit warmer than us is just better suited to do that experimentation. But no, I didn't see any issues. I mean, they, they were definitely um, somewhat paler than maybe normal. I don't know. Uh, nothing I that was super noticeable, I guess, is the best answer to that question. Um, okay, and sorry, one more question here. Do, do you yeah. see more or different pests with the clover, thrips or aphids? Right. More good disease question. given the dense foliage? Yeah, good question. 
Um, I'm seeing less of every single pest except uh, slugs. So I am not using any row cover in this system. Um, there's like no flea beetles. Um, you'll see, I mean, there's a little bit of everything, but I mean, part of what I love about this is when you get down on your hands and knees and you look in there, there's all, I, you know, I wish I knew more about what all these insect varieties were, but like there is all kinds of stuff happening in there. Um, and it seems to be, you know, my goal is like this working ecosystem that's really diverse. Um, that seems to mostly be playing out. Um, yeah, slugs. Slugs are problematic and I'll get to that right now with lettuce. Um, I mean, they're on everything. So like, so I laid this out, explain this for a second, um, on, on the Y axis on the left here, yield, you have like 100%, which would mean like standard yields down to 0%. Um, and then there's sort of three columns. There's ones that we've tried, there's weird ones, which I'll explain. And then there's ones that we've never tried and I'm kind of guessing how they would do. So if they're up towards the top of that graph, then I think their yields are roughly equivalent to what you would get in bare soil. And if they're all the way down like cucumbers, their yields are terrible. So ones that we've tried, cabbage is equivalent yields, hemp, tomatoes, uh, broccoli, delicata, green beans, dry beans, I would say are all in that zone of like, maybe they're yielding a little less, maybe the same, but they're roughly equivalent. Kale and chard, I felt like did well, but, um, but were not quite as big. Um, hot pepper starts to be like, you kind of want to ask yourself whether that's a crop that makes sense um, to do in clover. Sweet peppers and cucumbers, we didn't have any luck with. Um, there are, there's a study from Italy where sweet peppers did great. Um, and so it could be that this is just what I'm seeing is really related to living in a cold place and those couple extra degrees of soil temperature that you miss because of the shading um, may really uh, be the determining factor there. Or they don't play well with clover. I don't know. Um, weird ones, summer squash was weird. They did not get nearly as big as my regular summer squash um, and they didn't yield as heavy, but they never succumbed to like powdery mildew or anything. They were there. I didn't have a succession planting. So they yielded for like two months or something crazy. Um, but I was only getting like two fruits per week off each plant. So I, it's just one of those, everything about this system is different. There's just to be uh, a, a huge number of variables, variables to explore. But I'm excited to put in like a row of summer squash and see if I can get away without any successions. And it's not like I, we all know that there's a problem, uh, a summer squash problem during those couple peak weeks. Um, so it, it could actually be an odd solution to that. Head lettuce was interesting. It grew well. I did not think it was going to do anything at all, but there was slug damage on that that made every single one of them unmarketable. But this was like a um, Boston type. It might be that a more upright um, romaine type also planted later um, I put mine in in early June it might be a nice solution for like you know hot um, hot season for July um, lettuce because it does get a lot of shading from the clover and so it was really nice and tender but um, but there was nothing I was going to be able to sell um, again just something to learn it's all about varieties and timing as it is with every other thing um, Field corn, um, I just haven't had it do great, but I every year there's been some other problem. This year, a pair of nesting sandhill cranes pulled most of it up. And <laughs> uh, anyway, it should work. Most of the clover living mulch research that's out there is actually based on field corn. Um, so I'm curious to see um, in, in future experiments how that does. I also grow like an heirloom that's very vigorous, but it may be that you just want a more modern hybrid um, in order to be competitive with the clover. I've never tried rye and oats. Rye and I can't see the right hand side of my screen still. So it says rye and then something else. Um, I'm really interested in the idea of getting grains going in this. I just sort of, uh, by mistake had a bunch of barley come up this spring that made beautiful heads. Um, mostly because those winter and early spring grains are actually growing vigorously before the clover starts growing vigorously. So they have a chance to get up above that canopy. Um, so that would be cool. 
I assume other winter squashes will do well, but I don't know because I haven't done them. Spring barley and oats, sweet. What does it say there, somebody? Sweet what? Popcorn. Oh, sweet corn and popcorn would be interesting. I bet you the yields are going to be somewhat reduced, but I don't know. And then there's something that starts with an E. I can't see. Early brassicas. Early brassicas, you know, I've been hesitant to try just because your clover is so aggressive at that time of year um, <clears throat> that I have trouble kind of picturing, um, you know, picturing them being able to compete with the clover, but I will try it. And then sort of like as the last thing, there's some things you're like, they're not going to work in this system. A direct seeded carrot is probably never going to thrive in a clover living mulch. Um, so this graph, like part of what I'm hoping with these trials is that we can start to like fill this in. Um, these percentages are obviously just sort of off the top of my head. It's just a rough feeling, but I'm hoping that with a group of farmers trialing these, we can start to dial in what crops work and within that, even what varieties of what crops work. Uh, Lincoln, have you ever encountered problems with competing root systems between clover and any of these crops? I'm sure. So, I mean, when we look at this graph and we're talking about yield reductions in this system, um, I assume that the primary, you know, mode of competition between the clover and the crop is happening in the root zone, um, you know, and it's just a, it's competition for resources. So, um, you know, I think, again, we're looking for a living cover that's going to be aggressive enough to really suppress weeds, but not so aggressive that it like destroys your yields. Um, and that is a really careful balance. You know, if you find, if, if you got something that was less competitive with your crop, well, it would also be less competitive with weeds. Um, and what I, the reason I think white clover, Dutch white works is that it's all concentrated in that top six inches of soil, its root system. And a lot of our crops are going to get down below that level pretty quickly. And when they do, they kind of have access to that pool of nutrients that's deeper and the moisture that's deeper. And so I think that's kind of why you see in this system slow cash crop, crop growth initially um, that really takes off. I think it basically has to get down below there and then spread out and it, it can start to like control these resources that are deeper down. But I don't know. I'm like just saying that. That makes sense to me intuitively, but I have, you know, I have no idea. This hasn't been studied enough for me to find the answer somewhere. And one more question came in. Uh, how many, how long have you had the clover there? Multiple years? How do you fertilize and with what? Or you haven't needed additional fertility yet? Um, Let's see. Okay, so um, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> Basically, the clover stays in place for like four years and you can keep planting into it. And slowly you're going to have pasture grasses moving into that clover until at some point you're like, this is just pasture with a lot of clover in it. <laughs> and at that point, it needs to be plowed down and renewed. So this is not permanent no-till, but it is removing a huge number of tillage operations Um you know, for a number of years in a row. Um, the other question was about fertilizing. I am hoping to learn way more about the nitrogen dynamics in the system and I don't really understand it. Um, so the issue is if you wanna look at the literature, it'll tell you what the end credit is for Dutch white clover, but the assumption is that you've plowed it down and it's rotting in, right? There's no study that I've been able to find that gives you any idea of what the end credit would be for a living Dutch white clover. There are some cool studies on field corn that look at, you know, they were fertilized at different rates and, um, and it kind of shows you where that levels off. So there's, I mean, there definitely are end savings, what they are and how to figure out how to adjust the end application rate off of your soil test if you have Dutch white living clover there, um, I can't really answer. Um, I've gotten away in, in a couple of years with a couple of different crops. I have not seen any yield difference between fertilized and unfertilized um, uh, test plots. Last year in the cabbage, um, there was a significant difference between fertilized and unfertilized. And there was a huge difference in a drought year between irrigated and unirrigated. Um, 
we usually use, you know, historically we've, we've used our own homemade compost for fertility and um, we would just put that down across the field with the manure spreader um, and some high value crops, we would actually just throw a couple handfuls of compost at the base of the plant um, for additional fertility. Otherwise we weren't fertilizing. This year, um, because we're hoping that what we do is you know, more relevant to more farmers, we switched to like a Crayer's, um, you know, pelleted chicken manure. Um, and that we're still just applying like a handful on um, either side of the plant. It's pretty silly. I need an applicator at this point, but that's what we're, that's what we did last year. Um, do you think I answered those questions, Stephen? Or whoever asked them, if you want to chime in, if I didn't answer your question, you let me know. Or I'll keep going. I'm going to keep going. But jump back in if you were dissatisfied with that answer um, or if I miss something. So the upsides, it's really practical and easy to manage. I just haven't done any other tillage reduction system where you just have to, you don't have to think. Um, you're just under sowing the clover everywhere. You come up with your crop plan in winter. Um, you can change it right up to the last minute. And I basically plow down what I need for crops that I think will only do well in bare soil, like carrots and beets, onions, and I leave the rest in clover and everything else goes into clover. Um, and I can adjust my crop plan right up to that last moment when I want to plant. Uh, it's scalable. Right, the living mulch is grown in place. So it's not about like buying stuff in that becomes impractical at large scales and it's easy to mechanize. Is it economically feasible? I feel like that's where I'm kind of stuck with it. Like for certain crops, for cabbage and hemp, like yes, 100%. For other crops, it really sort of depends. And I feel like we need good numbers on what the labor savings are, which are huge. So it eliminates weeding and or it replaces weeding with mowing i should say and there's a lot less mowing than there would be cultivating um, it reduces inputs again i don't have a number for that end savings but that's significant and tractor passes we're only going through once pre plant to mow and then again to transplant and then to harvest compared with my normal system because we're organic um, would be plow disc disc harrow harrow shape my bed, cultivate, 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 uh, <laughs> harvest, right? So I've removed like 10 passes probably. Um, and it's reducing emissions for that reason, also for input savings and everything else. It's definitely increasing soil C and increasing biodiversity. On the other hand, there's this competition, right? Which is nutrient competition, as I was just discussing in that root zone. And so, Different crops seem to be able to handle this better or worse than other crops. Um, there's definitely this competition for nutrients and you can see it because the transplants yellow before they bounce back. And this does not seem to change. Like if I put down more nitrogen, it seems like the clover will take it to begin with before it becomes accessible somehow to that transplant. So almost no matter how heavy I fertilize, I see some yellowing um, occur post-transplanting. Interestingly, I didn't see it with the direct seeded green beans, uh, dry beans. Then there's photosynthetic, photosynthetic competition, which is not a big deal except right after, um, right after the crop germinates or is transplanted. If the clover, which maxes out at like eight inches or so, if it's literally taller than your crop, you have a problem. Um, so that's manageable, but it's, you know, it does need to be managed. And then I think these cooler soil temperatures underneath there are um, problematic, although you can think of plenty of crops where that would be a good thing. Um, you know, the sort of verdict is they're mostly meeting our goals. Uh, this system is mostly meeting the goals, as I said in the beginning, was to manage a healthy, diverse ecosystem that produces blank, I can't see it, it's underneath this screen, probably says something like food uh, with as little labor and as few inputs as possible. All right, so then I was excited to, let's see if I turn on this light. Is that weird? It's getting dark. Um, so 
I was excited about this. I'm writing about it and going to conferences and talking about it. It seems like people are interested. Um, and almost everybody was kind of like, I was like, oh, you should run a trial. And almost everybody was like, yeah, yeah I'll run a trial as soon as I know that it works. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I won't know if it works. All I can tell you, you know, I have kind of taken it as far as I can take it at Sawyer. Like it, it works in my soil with my equipment for my crop mix, like all these different, but it gets so specific as you, everybody on, on this call knows because uh, all of our farms are really different. So I was like, all right, let's create some kind of structure where um, we can have multiple trials run. Um, and then the other thing that was coming up going to conferences is like you go to a tillage reduction round table or whatever, right? And everybody's talking about something different. Like tillage reduction is just a mature enough subject at this point that the branches of it are, are like different. So we're all sort of sitting in there having a, a different conversation. Um, somebody who's just talking about crimping rye, I don't have that much specifics to share with them and vice versa. So really trying to get people to run coordinated trials where we're doing like the same thing so that when we get into a room together in the winter, everything we have to share with one another is, is relevant. So, oh yeah, so I, my friend Will, Will, are you on this call? Maybe he is. Um, I was complaining about this to him um, and he has a background in like tech entrepreneurship stuff. And he was like, oh, you just start a nonprofit, pay people to do the trials. If the problem is people are scared to do it because they're afraid they're gonna lose money, figure out how to give them money. Um, so uh, with Will's guidance, um, we've, we've started this nonprofit um, here's like a, where well, this is not even part of the pitch anymore, but this is like one slide from, from a pitch we were working on, but there's basically going to be four parts of this nonprofit. So there's the farm partner network, which is these coordinated trials. There's data teams that are going to go around and collect the data for the farmers. Cause we all know that it's very difficult to collect data during the season. Um, there's gonna be a farm lab, uh, at his place. So we can do kind of university style, very small trials where, um, you know, where on a farm, you're trying to make it not fail. You really want it to work um, versus this farm lab where we can afford to do, you know, really small trials of things that, that probably will fail. Um, and then we want to be able to talk about this, um, you know, so that these systems can be adopted. So a bunch of people on this call are going to be doing trials um, starting or they'll be establishing Clover next year. Um, so they're part of the first farm partner network. So we're running coordinated on-farm trials, meaning like on a farm where it actually matters, where the data is like relevant, where it's not a university style thing where uh, you have to kind of wonder if it has anything to do with anyone's actual farm. Um, we'll provide most of the data collection and analysis. Um, and then we're paying farmers, uh, hopefully to cover their time and, and to cover yield loss in the trial year. And the goal is somewhat bigger than just the clover, though, which is hopefully if we have the system in place, we could start to plug in other innovative ideas um, into that same network. All right, so there's four steps. This is if you're interested in a trial um, on your own um, at your farm, or if you want to work with us, I'll have some contact information at the end. Now I'm going to pause for a minute before I just like launch into the next like nitty gritty of how you get clover established and all that. This is a good time for, for broader questions, I think. Or I can keep going. You tell me, Stephen, are things coming? Yeah, I have a few questions that came in with the registrations that I okay. can go ahead and- uh, Oh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, do it. Let's see. Let's see. I had one. What is the pounds per acre seeding rate? Is there- that's the first one of three. You want to answer that first? We're get we're gonna hit that like in the next couple slides. Okay. Is there a nurse crop involved in germination? Next couple slides. And can you seed into a spring cash crop of brassicas? Next couple slides. Those are great. All right. Perfect. We must be right on track then, guys. <laughs> um, one more here. So um soil health observations or benchmarks. Great question. Um, Caro, are you there? Or did you blank your screen because you walked away and you're making dinner? Hey. You anticipated my next move, but 
your coffee <laughs> too stuck into cooking. Cool. Um, yeah, so we took, um, we did, uh, in, uh, did we do an infield soil health assessment, Lincoln, as well as uh, cash test? No, um, we did cash, cash test. test. We should do infield soil health assessments uh, this coming season. When in spring, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was on the spot where um, you currently had. Um, Brassicas. Right. Yeah, exactly. And we also did we I'm trying to remember what we did because I've done so many of these field tests. Do we also take um, samples where you're going to establish next year? Yeah, we did. So I didn't mean to make you say it. Yeah. I meant yeah. I was hoping. So uh, Caro's helping us with this um, stair grant for next year um, where we're doing like more official side by side trials. Um, but I was thinking, Caro, if you could just explain the cash test, uh, which my sort of general understanding, sure. it's the best kind of thing we have to like capture soil carbon dynamics that's that's out there. Yeah. Um, so the Cornell um, Comprehensive Assessment of Soil Health, which I can, I'm happy to drop a um, link into the chat in just a minute um, to their website. But um, what's great about that test is it provides some nutrient um, information, but also provides information like soil respiration, um, uh, protein uh, content of the soil. Um, uh, what else is in there? Um, you know, total carbon. Um, and a bunch of other indicators. It also requests that the person collecting the samples uh, take a compaction test, which is really important. Thank you, Ben. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, but that's you know not required. You can send that in, um, and it gives you an overall score for your soil health. And that is a really great way to. Com the score is basically based on this giant pool of data that. Cornell has from all of the samples that have been sent in for the um, assessment of soil health. And that gives you a good sense of kind of how your field is stacking up. Um, so off the top of my head, those are just some of the indicators. I'm happy to put a more comprehensive response in the chat. Um, but that's a really valuable way to kind of look at um, overall soil health outcomes in kind of a holistic way compared to <laughs> other soil tests, which are often just kind of here's your organic matter and some nutrient information on your pH. Yeah. Um, you can also go through University of Maine if you want a cheaper test. It does some of the same indicators. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, so I think the the you know everybody who's doing trials next year will pay for cash tests on the control plot and the clover plot. I guess I would say you know if you've ever grown clover as a cover crop and then just uh, plowed it down and felt the soil, um, it is it is doing beautiful things. Um, so I don't know if that answers that question about uh, my observations, but like, um, no, the soil underneath is is just lovely. And then um, Piyush, I think, is on this call too, is looking at um, how we might do some insect diversity studies. Um, and Ruben, is Ruben Perea on this call? Um, is doing soil um, microscopy Defer. there's a name there's a name for it that I don't remember um but basically taking um some soil sticking it underneath the mic you put you dilute it in water you put it under the microscope and you look at what classes of organisms you have there so you know ho we're hoping somehow to do um to integrate this cash test with just some measurement of above and below ground biodiversity but observationally I think it's fair to say Caro like the soil looks lovely underneath the clover. Oh yeah. Um, I also want to just throw out there if anyone's in, uh, if any of your trial participants are in Massachusetts, we do have another, we have funding for another round of um, no cost uh, Cornell tests. So they, sh you know, folks. Oh, cool. Yeah, so you can have them reach out to me to take advantage of that if they want to get that paid for um, for the first year. Great, cool. Um, okay. Should I continue here? Great. So yeah, this uh, I think uh, go ahead and continue. I just, I'm going to, if some folks have to leave a little bit earlier than uh, the scheduled end time, I'm gonna have Molly drop an evaluation form into the chat. We'd love to get your feedback so we can keep delivering uh, relevant uh, workshops for all of you. Great, cool. So this is like, 
sort of the, this next chunk of slides is um, how you would very practically do this. So there's four steps. There's planning it, there's establishing the clover, seeding or transplanting, and then managing the clover and weeds after that. Hello. This is my thing. Oh, there you go. Um, so planning is just figuring out where you want to run that trial. Um, the only sort of like difficult planning piece of this is that you have to be thinking two years ahead. So it gets established and then you plant into it in the second year. You don't want to plant into it in the first year. I'm getting a lot of questions about this. I maybe even should have had a slide about it. A lot of people are like, can I sow the clover and then plant into it? It will not suppress weeds in year one. It's just not rugged enough to keep weeds back. You've got to get it established in year one and plant into it in year two. So year one is just about getting that clover started and getting a nice strong stand of clover. Um, and then you want to think about, you know, what you want to trial, what crop you want to trial in 2024. Um, I just put down there as a note, another shout out to under sowing, which is like, there's no harm to getting clover established wherever. It's easy to terminate. It's a great cover crop. So it's not like you've locked yourself into anything. If you get a whole bunch of clover established this year, you could decide to do no trial at all next year and plow it down. Or you could decide you're doing a trials on a quarter acre of it and plow the other four acres down, whatever. I don't think I talk much about termination in here, but um, if you can get out as soon as your soil is dry enough and give that clover a single disking as it's coming out of winter, it's basically done for. And a second disking is going to clean it up and you move forward. I mean, this is nothing like getting rid of rye. Um, it's just easier to get rid of than, than uh, most other clovers too. There's just not a lot of biomass there. So your discs do a lot of work because they're not chopping through a lot of residue. Pretty much anything you bring into the field um, is going to be is relatively effective compared to what you're used to with cover crops, just because there is less biomass above ground there. So there's three methods of getting the clover established, um, under sowing, throwing it in with oats and throwing it in with rye. So we're gonna start with under sowing, which is what we mostly do. Where we're at, I like to do it in July. The first week of August would be the latest. Your clover really wants to be six weeks old at first frost. It would rather be eight weeks old at first frost and 10 weeks would be better than that and 12 weeks would be better than that and so on. And the reason for that is it doesn't start growing from stolons until it's six to eight weeks old. So if it hasn't initiated that process um, when you start getting heavy frost, I think, who was I talking to about this today? I was talking to somebody about this today. I think if it hasn't initiated that process of starting stolons at that point, it just won't. And so now it's trying to get through winter with just its uh, initial tap root that it put down. So timely establishment is super important if you want to get, um, if you want it to reliably overwinter. Um, I basically am under sowing at last cultivation. So for corn, um, that would be like in early July. And then the last thing I would, um, I would under sow into is like onions because they're weak and they don't like any competition at all in late July. There you go. All that information is on that slide. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is just, you know, if the cash crop is fully canopied, there's not going to be any light for your clover to grow. So you don't want to, you know, you need to be a little bit before that, but that usually coincides with last cultivation anyway. Um, so I'm going to go through and do my final uh, cultivation when there's a little bit of moisture in the forecast, but, um, but not a thunderstorm. I just have one of these like solo chest spreader things. It sits right here. I'm mixing it with corn so that I can see it as it comes out. If you just broadcast clover seed, you can't see what's happening. You don't have any sense of what your spray pattern is. So you've got to have something in there that you can see. And then also the clover, you know, trying to get like a handful of clover spread down a 500 foot row um, is difficult. So the more kind of filler you have in there, the better chance you have of getting good, even coverage everywhere. So that's why I do that mix. I'm aiming for about a pound per thousand square feet, which is 45 pounds an acre, which is insane. Um, regular rates that are suggested are like eight to 10 pounds per acre. Um, in the case of under sowing, it's in July, so it's hot and dry. 
and I'm not incorporating it in any meaningful way. So I'm not helping it really germinate well. So I'm going to assume that a lot of that seed is just not going to germinate because conditions are less than ideal. Um, for me, you know, this is not a place to skimp on spending money. Um, I'm, you know, for most vegetable growers are making many thousands of dollars per acre. So the difference between spending, um, you know, $75 on an acre on cover crop seed or $150 an acre on cover crop seed is just not meaningful. It's, I just think it's not a great place to, to try to save um, pennies. Um, and we sometimes do a final hoeing there after broadcasting to catch any weeds and then people's footprints and the hoe might scuffle in a little of that clover seed, but often we don't do that. Lincoln, uh, is there a reason why you're using uh, corn as a filler instead of oats or some other seed crop? Um, so the cracked corn is just really easy to see. Um, and it seems to mix well. I guess I would be worried that oats are a little bit light. I don't know how well the clover would mix in with them, but I don't see why it wouldn't work. I'll tell you what doesn't work is sand or limestone. Um, <laughs> they, it tends to like bridge. Um, it's really annoying. Um, but um, yeah, I get my chicken feed from this guy, Bob Crow in, in New York. And he's just like cracking everything. So it's just like, cracked grains in there. My very favorite thing to use is cracked corn for chicks. It's, it's like bigger than grits, but smaller than normal cracked corn. Um, and it's bright yellow. So you just see it as it, as it comes out of your chest cedar, but there's nothing magic about that. I mean, what, you know, whatever works for you works for you. So Lincoln, the, the, the corn is more for visualization. It's not actually germinating. No, I mean, no, no, no. Right. Good, good question. First of all, it would never go through the whole corn wouldn't go through your the hole in the bottom of your broadcast spreader is too big. And I'm not trying to germinate corn. Um, I, I just wanted the clover to grow. So I want whatever's in there to be it is truly filler. Yeah. Any other questions on there on this? Um, yes. Average cost per pound for white clover. Yeah, I think last se last season the pr the prices since the pandemic have been insane because everybody's uh, like doing yard renovations and whatever. So, and that's the main market for Dutch white clover is people's yards. Um, so last year I was paying almost four hundred dollars for a fifty pound bag. Mm. What's that? Eight bucks a pound? Why is this so hard for me? <laughs> Come on. There's so many people on this call. I'm talking. I can't do math <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, that's about right. You all do the math. Uh, yeah, it was like 380 or something, I think, for a 50-pound bag. I get it from Greenfield Farmers Co-op. Um, you know, the thing about the cost is not just – it's expensive. I'm not saying that it's not. If you're going to leave it in place for a few years and plant into it, you're going to divide by that number of years also. So um, if I'm putting down um, – almost $400, I get to call that $100 a year for four years. Mm. Um, mm. Good point. Another question that came up is if you think the system could work on a small urban farm where farming is done by hand, no tractors. Yeah. I mean, so far we're all hand scale right now or in my description of this. Um, and I'll keep walking you through that. You know, I think on... For a farm where every square foot is valuable and maximizing yield per square foot is really valuable, this is probably not the best solution. Like if you're looking to reduce tillage on a very you know, small area, you've got a lot of options out there in terms of deep mulch and all kinds of, yeah, all kinds of organic mulches or tarps um, that, are, that are better suited to maximizing yields per square foot. This is really not a yield maximizing system. What this system does is, is in general, lower yield somewhat, but it compensates for that yield loss with labor savings, fertilizer savings, um, tractor pass savings, weeding savings. Um, but that's not really relevant to you. If your limiting factor is how many square feet I have to farm in, this is probably not uh, the way to go unless you're interested and you want to demo it. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. 
Um, you're going to get some weeds that germinate with the clover. And this was just a whole thing I had to wrap my head around. Um, I used to like, I would flame weed it in sometimes, especially in corn, which can handle flame weeding um, or, or onions. And I'd be like, ah, oh, there's too many weeds. I flame it in and I'd do it again. Um, some weeds are going to come up. I mean, you want to have it clean. You want to have cultivated a bunch of times before you under sow. You know, you don't want to, you certainly don't want to put it in a, where there's, without removing all the weeds, but there's going to be some weeds in it and it's okay. If you're going to leave that clover in place the following year, especially, they will almost, almost none of them will come up through the canopy. Um, and this is just part of a, a shift in mindset of being like, it's, there's, there is, there is less control in this system or like the mechanism of control kind of goes from like here to here. Like you're not controlling the details anymore. You're like controlling the overall system. Um, but there's some weeds in there. And for somebody like me that really grew up like feeling like a successful farm was a clean farm. Um, that was a big transition and shift in, in thinking for me. I used to sort of pride myself. I, I used to judge my, um, my success by like worth as a farmer, by how clean my fields were. That was like hard to let go of. All right. So this is, this is, um, the spring after you've undersown the clover. So you're looking at a hemp stump there. It's hard to get the clover underneath certain crops like hemp in particular. Um, and that's what that bare spot is, but it's starting to green up. This is, um, again, we're really cold. So this is, uh, May 10th. Um, we don't put animals out to graze until the 15th usually. Um, cause we just don't have much grass until then. And you can see here's four days later, you're like, all right, that's looking pretty good. And it's starting to close those hemp holes up. And then by, by late May, all the stress about whether you have a good stand of clover is usually gone and it's spreading nicely. So that's under sowing. Okay. Questions about under sowing? Stop there. I'm about to get into sowing it with oats and sowing it with rye. Any last questions about underselling? Going once. It's only going to go once. Cool. Um, all right. So two other methods. You can sow uh, clover with oats in late summer. I don't bother with the peas because it's kind of redundant um, and they're expensive. So the one thing here is that you want to pull it back from your normal oat window by a as a couple weeks if you can, because clover would like to get going by late July for me, maybe first week of August, if you're a little bit warmer. Um, but whatever your normal oat window is, your clover would probably like to go in a couple weeks earlier. Um, you know, there's a bunch of questions about whether the oat is then, uh, the oats are then gonna go to seed. I've had it happen. I've never had oats as a weed though. Um, so I don't know, this method works pretty well. Um, and I sometimes will let the, um, the oats come up, like actually German, I'll drill them. I don't have a grass box on my drill, so I'll just drill the oats. And then once it's up a little bit, I'll go in and broadcast my clover so that there's something kind of shading it and, and helping it out. But I've also done it simultaneous, uh, or I'll drill the oats and then walk right through and broadcast and that works fine too. Um, the sort of most foolproof thing to do is frost or spring sowing into overwinter rye. Rye and Dutch white clover just like have a love affair and it just does so well underneath there. And um, you can or cannot mow the oats, uh, mow the rye down. It's kind of up to you. Um, I, I like to sort of put it on the ground at some point. Um, but you're going to do that in a fully fallow season. So that's the downside to that method is like that block has to be out of production for that year. So let's say you were going to do it right now. Let's say you're going to go out tomorrow and, and so that, um, so the clover into a stand of rye, you would then not touch that piece for the whole rest of the season, except to maybe mow those, uh, to mow the rye off. I believe it would be possible to mow. Um, and bail that straw if you if that's part of your system. Um, but I wouldn't swear it. And I wouldn't do it if you were going to sell the straw. But it's probably fine if it's for your own use. Who's I talking to about this? Ash, who maybe is on this call. Um, 
So let's see. Oh, and then I think I was talking to Ash about this too, the idea that like, oh, actually maybe if it was spring sown or frost seeded, it would be possible to put late brassicas in because the stand of clover, even though it's first year clover, maybe would be strong enough to suppress weeds, but I'm not sure. Anyway, that's all kind of muddying the waters. The simplest thing to do is you go broadcast the clover into the rye um, anytime until, you know, into April. Um, and you, I've never not had a beautiful stand. I'm going somewhat lighter, 30 to 40 pounds an acre. I'm sure I could do way, way less, but same thing. I'm kind of like, oh, so save like some money here and like maybe not have it work. Um, so that's that. Uh, Lincoln, when and how close do you mow that first year of sowing? Oh, um, do you mean mowing the, the small grain cover crop? Shauna, would you like to uh, expand a little bit on your question? Yeah, Lincoln, um, the cover crop and oh, you, hey, how you doing? Um, the, co the cover crop, but also, um, you know, whether you do the rye or the oats, but what if you, um, do you also go down enough to cut that clover at all anytime during that first year? Um, that's a good question. You know, if it's into the rye so that it's going to be there all spring, summer, fall, I will definitely mow um, in order to discourage other perennials from getting a foothold in there. Because if you think about the, the, the sort of superpower of Dutch white clover is it can persist. It could just be stepped on 20 times a day and it'll be all right. It could be mown twice a week and it'll be all right and almost nothing else can stand up to that amount of mowing. I'm not suggesting that you actually do that, but I am suggesting that you keep an eye on it. And if you see that there is perennial weeds coming in there, or if you see that annual weeds are sticking their heads up, it's always fine to mow that clover as long as it's well-established. So I'm definitely you know, gonna leave it alone for six or eight weeks until I can just tell that it's you know, a relatively mature looking plant um, that can handle both the tractor tires and the lawnmower. Um, uh, I might be a little, if I was just gonna do the whole thing with, with, a, with a lawnmower, maybe I would you know, be a little less worried about how well established it is. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think you can over mow, um, but the goal of this system is to reduce labor too. So I, I'm not trying to encourage anybody to, um, to do more than is necessary either. I think it's a little counterintuitive about this whole system that you just don't have to do that much. Um, and you'll miss out on a lot of the benefits of it is if you, <laughs> if you put in the labor that you would have put in anyway. Mm. Um, so, uh, but that's a good question. So I would say if you're going to do that first mowing and your goal is just to take that small grain down and put it down on the ground, go high. Why mess with the clover? But after that, you kind of want to go low so that you're going to hurt any grasses or whatever that are sneaking in there. Um, and, and your clover's growing points are at the ground level. So you'll never um, do significant damage to your clover. That's what makes it able to withstand all that kind of traffic. Hmm. What, what do you think, Shauna? You want more, awesome. is that good? No, no, I think that's good. Thanks, I appreciate it. Cool. All right, so that kind of, now we're at the end of establishment. Either you've undersown it, you've done it with your oats, you've done it into winter rye, and now it's the following year. It's time to plant into the clover. I still don't know if it's better to mow in early spring to discourage weeds or leave it alone so you have this really thick growth of Dutch white clover right before transplanting. When you mow it, it almost makes this like mulch of dead clover that seems like maybe that's a good thing. Um, don't know. For all of my pre-plant, but I definitely mow before transplanting. Um, and to do that, I use a drum mower, which is kind of a, a sort of heavy duty take on a regular disc hay mower. Um, I don't like to use my brush hog. Uh, it's just like, it's not meant to get dialed in for like fine mowing like that. Uh, flail would work great. A lawn mower is fine, but you have to stay on top of it. If you left it alone for like a month, um, it'll just like clog. So you want to, if you're, if you're trying to do a trial plot, that's not going to be 
based on tractor. Um, you definitely want to stay on top of your mowing so that you uh, aren't super frustrated. You can go through even with a weed whacker if this is like a single bed or two kind of scale trial. So transplanting by hand. You mow the clover short, as short as you can. You make a hole with that bulb auger on the cordless drill. So the bulb auger is basically a giant drill bit. It's a hole for you. And that hole needs to be a little bit bigger than your plug. So I just throw a handful of compost into each hole. So someone's going through making the hole. Someone's got a five gallon bucket behind them and is throwing a handful of compost at every hole. And the next person comes in and actually sets the transplant in. Um, I drip everything. You could water it in. Moisture is like opposite in clover as what it would be in a normal system, which is to say it needs more water early in the season when the clover is super competitive and juicy. And it needs less water in July and August because the clover is not growing that much at that time of year and it's shading the soil. So you have um, relatively little evaporation and transpiration occurring in your hottest, driest months, but you have a lot of transpiration happening in your what you normally would think of as a, a wet month and your clover is going to compete hard for soil moisture until your crop gets down your crop's root system gets down below the clover so being aware of watering up front in your season is um seems to be an important component of success here um then i'm saying think about fertility i for people who are doing trials, I am recommending that whatever fertility regime they're using on their control, they also use on their trial plot, just because we've got enough variables going on. We're basically trying to find out what are yields look like in comparison? What does labor look like in comparison? If we start to throw fertility questions in there, even though I think they're really, really interesting, I think it'll start to muddy the waters in, as far as figuring out like the basics of this system. And then as you're transplanting, expect it to take a long time. This is not like transplanting into bare soil. It sucks. You're going to be like 100 feet down the road being like, oh, my God, Lincoln is an idiot. I hate this. And at that point, you need to say to yourself, I'm not going to be weeding this bed. Mm -hmm. So, like, I can totally afford to take some extra time because this is kind of the only major labor event that's going to occur between now and harvest. You're just going to be running around with a lawnmower in there a couple times between transplanting and harvest. So it's okay if it takes a little while. Here's mechanized transplanting. This first thing is a coulter running through the soil. It's going to slice it like a pizza slicer. Now you're seeing a ripper tooth there in the middle of the screen. That's running like six inches deep to kind of loosen that furrow. This rubber wheel is driving the chain that runs the actual transplanter and sets the transplants down. This next plate is a double disc opener. It's gonna open the furrow. Then this long silver thing is on top of uh, the transplanter shoe. <coughs> and these red wheels are packing the soil in around the transplant. It looks like this is squash. You can see it's not closing the furrow very well here. And I'll show you how we fix that problem. What I don't like, you're about to see, there's a lot of furrow disturbance here. I just don't want that much bare soil, but look along the edge of that shoe. It's just kind of like shoving the soil up on top of the clover. And I don't like that. because that gives weeds an opportunity to grow right in the furrow where you don't want them. Hmm. So here's that first um, piece. Mechanical transplanter sold us this no-till attachment. Don't buy it. Um, I gave mine to Paul. I told him it didn't work, but he was willing to take it for free. There's no way, to, I wasn't gonna sell it. Um, maybe he'll have luck with it, but I, I, I don't like it and I don't recommend it. And the one that I made at home for like zero dollars um, works way better. So there's just this straight coulter up front and that's that ripper tooth you're looking at. Then to weight it down, I put a rock in the weight bucket. 
uh, in a weight bracket. And then I just welded on some gas pipes so I could put a full like weightlifting set back there. So there's like 350 pounds back there. Uh, here's a photo of the, on the left-hand side is a photo of that gas pipe and some, some added support structure I put in there to hold the, the weight. And on the right-hand side, you're seeing some additional weights that are above the drive wheel um, because so much weight on the back was kind of like popping that drive wheel up out of the soil so it wasn't engaged well. This kind of nitty gritty, um, I wanna show everybody. And then on the other hand, like anybody who really needs information about transplanter modification should definitely get in touch with me directly because you know we could talk about this for, for days. That furrow disturbance that I was talking about on the left, leads to weeds in the furrow, which you can see on the right. There's gallon soga coming up with that squash there. And what's annoying is that's right where your freaking crop is. And then between that row and the next crop row, it'll be like pure, beautiful clover, and then your crop and some weeds. Now, these weeds don't come up until like mid-July. The reason is that the clover is actually gonna immediately close that canopy. Like the photo on the left, if I took a photo again two weeks <laughs> later, you wouldn't see that furrow there. It's completely canopied over. But there are weeds that have germinated underneath the canopy and over the next month or so, they slowly fight their way up and then they emerge. It doesn't seem to have a huge effect on, on my yields, I don't think, because the, the crops are very well established by the time the weeds show up. But still, I mean, maybe I'm just stuck in this mindset. Like I was saying, I want like a clean field. Now clean includes clover, but um, maybe I'm still stuck on it. It's like, why am I trying to solve this problem? But I would like to solve the problem <laughs> anyway. And so what we're doing with this uh, CESA adaptation grant is we've taken, um, this is a picture of a mechanical um, tulip bulb planter that they use in Holland. And it lifts the soil on that kind of middle buster. It lifts it so it travels vertically and then it sets it back down. So instead of like pushing the furrow aside, like this action, it's lift, it's like splitting and lifting and mm -hmm. setting it back down. Mm -hmm. And so um, Stephen helped us get um, this climate adaptation grant so we could bring this design to a fabricator and he's working on basically welding this shape on the outside of the shoe on our existing transplanter. And so we're gonna see how that does. I should say before leaving this, like the transplanter works, it works. You know, we did a couple acres of crops with it this season. And so it's not like it's not working, but it's not optimal. I hope that we'll have something that's awesome that we can lend to everybody through this nonprofit in 2024 uh, for people who are running trials. Here's another option that's out there. <clears throat> this is um, Steve Groff. Um, if you guys know him, has been involved in no-till stuff for, I don't know. I don't know who's been doing it for longer than Steve. Um, and he uh, and I talked a while ago about this water. Trevor Hardy is another great at, at Brookfield, Brookdale, Brook, whatever, in Hollis, New Hampshire. Um, Trevor has a lot of information about this. He was like, oh, you should talk to Steve because he's messed with this. But Trevor sells um, one of these and this goes on front of your water wheel transplanter. Noltz sells these too. And it's basically two offset coulters. Those coulters are not perfectly in line. They're set off by a little bit. So they actually kind of like mess up a little bit of a trench as they move through. Um, the downside is this is only a one row item for whatever reason that was explained to me and I can no longer remember, it cannot be adapted to two rows. So it's kind of, for me, that's kind of a, a significant limitation, but it's way cheaper <laughs> than a mechanical transplanter, um, you know, because it doesn't have any of those moving parts. It's just people sticking transplants in the holes. You'll notice there's sidewall compaction because you can imagine when that, when this point, as it comes from the factory goes in the soil, it's going to create these like super slick hard sidewalls. And so Steve welded on these little um, like additional, um, what would we even call it? Almost like a chisel, like a flat chisel onto that 
um, point, and that helps crumble the sidewall a little bit. Hmm. So another option um, that's out there maybe. Plug size. I like to use as big of a plug as I can, because like I said, the issue here is that you're gonna have competition between the clover and your crop. So if you can put in a crop that's bigger, um, it should be able to overcome that. And that has basically been borne out in my observations, although there's plenty of exceptions to that. Like the delicata squash, I saw no difference this season between 128s that went out and um, and like little like pots that were pretty sizable, probably like an inch and three quarters by an inch and three quarters. So very different size transplants. And um, the yields basically converged by the end of the season. Anyway, if you're using a bulb auger, it means that you're not putting in that many plants. I would encourage you to do a relatively large transplant as big as you can kind of justify because you're going to put it in gently with your hands. Um, you can buy a variety of bulb auger sizes so that your plug is about right. I have a note here that you definitely want to look for a bulb auger with an extended handle. They come like 24 inches long and you don't have to bend over to make the hole and you will be very grateful to to be standing up straight by the time you drill your hundredth hole. If you're going to use a mechanical transplanter, um, you need to think about how big of a plug size you can get away with. First of all, that probably means you're dealing with more area. So you have to think about what your greenhouse can handle size wise, you know, or just is taking up more, more square footage. Um, and I just had an issue, even though mine theoretically will put in up <laughs> a four inch pot, it won't actually do that without like mangling a root bulb in the furrow it's just like a little too much to ask to get this thing into unplowed soil without kind of chopping that root ball in half so i would say a 50 is about as big as i was able to get that reliably was going in without damaging the root ball um same thing it's just a different relationship you're just like things look different uh a little more patience trust um I don't know about failure. I shouldn't have written failure. Uh, maybe um, nature. I like that better. Um, so you know you're gonna, you're going to see some yellowing when your transplants go in, and you're going to see some slow initial growth. Like they don't do that much in June. Um, they often are kind of invisible. You look out, and it's just a sea of Dutch white clover, basically, and you have to be like look around for the vegetables. I like that now. Um, the way I look at it now is like I have a fully functioning ecosystem out there. One of the things that it's doing is growing food for people to eat. Um, and the fact that that's not like dominating the landscape means that there's all these other cool ecosystem functions happening. I think what's key is, again, don't put in like a ton of labor to try to like save these things because you're so nervous about them because you're going to ruin the best part of the system, which is that it's low labor. Don't do anything but mow every once in a while. So all you have to do left, all that's left to do is mowing. Um, I'm mowing for two reasons. One is if I feel like the clover is actually providing photosynthetic competition with my transplant, i.e. it's taller than it. Um, and so that is usually requires one mowing, which is like a week or two after transplanting, the clovers bounce back after it's gotten mown, but your transplant's not really growing yet. And so another mowing is usually called for at that point. And then at some point in July, like I said, you'll get some annual weeds that come up through the clover canopy. And I just go through and, and take those down, depending on what kind of weeds you have and how much pressure there is. You might do that twice or three times. Um, one note I should have put on here for winter squash, I will do a final mowing right before they start to run because that'll be your last opportunity to do that. Um, I don't, this, this seems sort of like the same information. <laughs> I like a weed whacker. I like a lawnmower, uh, good clover. Oh, you know, postseason, put things on the ground using a flail or a lawnmower or a weed, whatever you've got, just make sure your residue goes down on the ground where it's going to rot and your clover can canopy back in. So you'll have a nice stand of clover so you can plant into it again that following year. The height of the deck on your lawnmower is, does a lot to determine how much, um, almost more as far as I can tell than like the power of the motor. The height of the deck 
can just accommodate a lot of that juicy clover material before it clogs up. This is cool. This guy, Stuart Farr at, um, is Stuart on this call? I doubt it. Wish I do look. not see Stuart here. I just need to interject just for a moment, Lincoln, that we are coming up on 6.30. Oh, we are. So of course, Great. folks are welcome to stay and continue and hear as much of this as you can. Uh, Molly's gonna once again put the evaluation form in the chat. And I did wanna mention that in this evaluation form, there is an option for you to indicate interest in learning more about participating in the trials. So oh, cool. if, that's, if you're on this call and you're not already doing that and you're interested, make sure you tick that box. Great. And um, also Molly has just put in a link to the July 20th event, which will be in person uh, at Sawyer Farm. So you get to see some of this in action, at least in one particular point in time of what we now know is a long <laughs> uh, multi-year process. So continue, Lincoln. Just wanted to make sure folks knew about yeah. all that before they signed off. Thanks. Yeah, I think I only have another couple slides here. Um, I just like this because Stuart's been playing with um, growing sunflowers for oil in clover uh, and is going to do uh, some trials with us next year. Um, but he made this Romo, he, you know, this is larger scale stuff. So he's got like, I think 250 acres. So he's got to figure out how to do this without a lawnmower, right? Um, and <laughs> This is the kind of cool innovation that I'm hoping that we get to see and like disseminate through these trials um, so that we're not just all working alone. Like, look, this is a very cool machine. He can run it um, and it's just offset, you know, it's offset to what his planter is. Um, and those are just hydraulic motors on lawnmower blades um, that are mowing between the, uh -huh. between the rows of um, sunflowers. Uh, they make these out in the Midwest for herbicide resistant weeds and soy, but they're in like 20, 30, 40 row models. Um, and they're wow. very, very expensive, but you know, ho ho hopefully we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. These are my last things. So this is kind of what I'm talking about when I, I'm talking about like running an ecosystem. One of the things that does is produce food. There's a lot of food coming out of this plot that you're looking at here. Um, but it's obviously doing other stuff too, because this is just a very complex mix of things. Um, this is uh, out of order, but those are the green beans after they germinated. Um, <laughs> I guess I just, I like this one because it's just, just a lot of the same, same principle. There's just a lot happening here. Mm -hmm. You got squash crawling over a sunflower, which I just threw in there because it's pretty. We always like keep a 72 of sunflowers on the, transplanter and every once in a while somebody reaches over and just throws one in um whatever crop we're planting um but yeah there's a lot of species happening in every square foot and they're interacting with one another and that's it so um if you want to if you want more um i'm happy to help you plan a trial uh, of your own or just answer clover questions in general the nonprofit is providing payments for implementation and crop insurance. So that's $1,000 in the first year for implementing, meaning establishing clover, and then crop insurance. So let's say you did side-by-side -side trial of um, summer squash, and you only got 75% yield in your clover plot compared to your control plot. Um, we will pay the difference in what your profit would have been. Uh, and then we also provide all these cool tests, like the cash test that Kara was talking about, um, possibly some biodiversity and photosynthesis tests. Um, even so, you should get in touch with me if that's interesting. And I'm also doing technical assistance for a bunch of people who are not running trials that are funded, they're just doing trials on their own. Um, so, I'm also happy to talk anybody through um, how they might think about this and. Um, and keep in touch with them also so they can be part of a, this whole group of people that's, that's trying to see um, if this thing has legs. And that's it. Thank you guys all for listening to a very long presentation. Um, I'm happy to stay on for whatever and do more, um, do more questions. Do you want to switch us out of full screen or do I do that myself? 
I think you can you can take yourself out of full oh, screen. Stop share. Yeah, perfect. And I'll put us on a gallery view so we can all see everybody. Great. Thank you so much, Lincoln. Um, any burning questions this evening? Just a, if you could, a quick show of hands, how many of you are planning to participate in these trials already? Just curious. I guess you'd have to turn your video on for that, but. Uh... <laughs> I don't see tons of them. Are you blocking the video? Is that why we can't? I don't think we're blocking the video, but anyway. Yeah, um, it is in our evaluation form. So if people are need some more time to think about whether they might be interested, or if you want more information about potentially participating, please fill out the eval and like give us that info. How do uh, you need to be to do it? Like how much square footage do you want in production to participate? Um, so I wanted to be a, a working commercial farm. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not super fussy. There's like on the one end, there's somebody in New Jersey doing dry beans. Like, I don't know. I don't even know how many acres. Um, or like Stuart, who who built that row mower, um, you know, profit on an acre of sunflower for oil is not a lot per acre. It's like maybe a thousand bucks an acre, right? So if Stuart's going to do a sunflower experiment, I'd like him to do a couple acres at least um, because we'll get better data that way and we could afford yield offsets on that. Um, if you want to do it with heirloom tomatoes, um, we really couldn't afford to have you do more than a couple beds, right? Because um, if, if that, that crop might be $150,000 an acre, um, <laughs> uh, I don't want you doing, I don't, I don't want somebody to do a half acre trial there and then tell me they got 75% yield that I'm supposed <laughs> to write a check for $30,000 or whatever. So, um, so there is no minimum, but like, okay. I, I do want it to be a commercial farm um, and, you know, have a, a few beds where I feel like, um, this is a valuable thing. There's going to be a couple of people kind of sitting down. You sh the bottom line is you should get in touch with me no matter what. Don't assume that you're too small. Um, and um, size will be one of many factors that we're kind of considering when we decide who to fund. And a lot of them, frankly, have nothing to do with anything you can control. Like we want to make sure all different soil types are represented. Mm -hmm. So you'd be likely to get funded if you were the only like, I don't have anybody with like a real high percentage of clay. Uh, it's just not the area we live in. But if that happens to be you, that might be the reason. Or if you're the only person who got in touch with me who wants to do, I still don't have anybody who's doing hemp uh, except for me. Um, so you know that kind of, that crop mix is also really important to us. But anyway, bottom line is if it's a commercial farm, try me out. Okay, I'll get in touch. Cool. All right. Uh, Ellen, I seem to recall you made a comment earlier on that you've been doing some of this kind of trialing at Astarte. Do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, sure. That's, a, that's fine. Um, I talked to Lincoln actually exactly a year ago. I have my notes in front of me. So I went ahead and threw his rate of Dutch white clover under our eggplants and our peppers. Um, and I could check the dates, but it was in July or maybe early August. And um, we had great eggplant yields and I'm really excited based on this talk to see what those beds look like next year. Um, and our peppers were not great, but I didn't think it was the clover's fault. So I'm gonna try it again. Not great. So this is, Ellen, you're just talking about the under sowing piece of this. Yeah, right? yeah, it was just the first year of it, so. Um, we already had the eggplants and peppers established and then I put the clover in um, just as Lincoln said, as the canopy was still filling out. Cool. I'm glad. So you were happy with it. Yeah, I'm definitely going to do it again. Right. <laughs> Great. Uh, Thank you, Ellen. Any other questions tonight for Lincoln? Are the growers in the room? It's not a question, but I've done uh, acorn squash for three years now in clover. And mix whatever else happens if you need in the mold. <laughs> and very, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, 
what? How, how's that going for you, Michael? Absolutely fabulous. Michael, you using the auger to do it and everything. Um, no shit. I you no. you are the first person I've ever run into who's doing it. Carol should be telling you about me. She's seen it. <laughs> Carol's <laughs> making dinner. So you <laughs> Matthew. <laughs> Great, uh, Michael. It would be good for you to reach out and be in yeah, touch with Lincoln, talk. it sounds like. Let's talk I've soon. Got, I've got a, I don't know what is it, 80 by 300 stretch in Clover right now. Hopefully to do the same thing in this year. Cool. And I just found that the auger system was so much easier. Set out your row and auger away. It's so much easier than trying to adapt it. Uh, single planting and double planting in four inch pots. And on a two foot spacing. And I wish I could show you a couple of pictures, but I don't, I'm not computer literate per se. <laughs> Maybe we'll just have to come out and have a look. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> you went on my um, Facebook page and scrolled back a couple of years, you'd probably find some of the pictures. <laughs> All right. Thank Michael. you, Michael. We have Andrew, you've got your hand up? Yes. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yep. Sure. Hi, Lincoln. Um, I have a question. I may have missed it, but are you doing trials with any grain growers? Um, no, I, I sent out an email. No, I would really like to find, um, a grain grower who's, uh, interested in this. I mean, we live in Massachusetts, so, uh, right. you know, um, but I feel like, you know, there's, I, I have a couple sort of leads and I would really like, yeah, I have, I, I, I feel very excited about the potential for this system for, small grains um i think it could work piush um was at the land institute for a bunch of years working on perennial kernza wheat um and we've been collaborating um and hopefully we're going to put in some kernza and and then stop me if i'm wrong piush i think we we're going to put the kernza in bare soil this fall and then frost seed clover into it in 2024 um, cause the Kernza needs is a little slow to go and, and maybe yeah. competition at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we'll do that this year. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I mentioned this cause, um, I'm down here on the vineyard, I guess, you know, we've met before, but, yeah. um, in our rotation, we have a, a sort of a three to five acre grain rotation in our vegetable operation. And, um, last fall, just for the heck of it, I had a, a, some white clover seeded in one portion of the farm and I drilled in some rye in there just for the heck of it to see if it would come up and um, it came up in parts of it came up pretty well um, but um, but I'm think but we just frost seeded some um, clover today on about a half acre or almost an acre and uh, my hope is that by next spring we'll be able to do maybe like a spring wheat in there just for the heck of it and see what happens. But I'm looking at ways of stacking and you know, uh, working this clover into our already sort of established rotational system, with, which also has grazing involved. Right. That's cool. I, I would love to, yeah, I mean, definitely keep me up to date on what's happening with the, with the small grains. The only thing I think I said that I randomly wound up with experience with, with it is that when I was talking about mixing that chicken feed in when I broadcast the clover, sometimes there's barley that doesn't get cracked um, right, yeah. this, this guy's um, operation it just slips through so there's uh, whole kernels and some of them seem to have sat there over the winter and then germinated in spring before the clover really took off and so there were some beautiful heads of barley uh, scattered through the field so I, I, I feel like spring barley um, could work in this system as long as you can drill it um, early enough that it's germinated and up before the clover gets really aggressive. I'm, I'm sort of bummed out that the rye didn't do better in your experiment. Do you have any idea why? 
Uh, the clover was pretty aggressive. I don't think it's, it's not a Dutch white clover. And um, we also have quite a rat problem. And I, I don't know if the rats got it, but it it, it, we, it was kind of dry. The, 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 the furrows are pretty open and it just wasn't good timing. It was it was something that's just I was driving around with a tractor. I had the machine on and I went in and, and did, you know, 300 feet. And cool. um, so but I'm pretty excited about trying to figure out um, even just doing cover crops stacking cover crops into the clover for portions of our rotation um like you know other kinds of covers like you know so anyhow but i'll, I'll be in touch i'd love to talk to you some more about this whole thing great you do, you do an awesome work awesome job thank you so much thanks buddy yeah yeah all right we have a question from seva any overlap yet with the nutrient density world in terms of food quality um I mean, Seva, if you want, <laughs> I can't even wrap my head around, uh, by Ellen. Um, uh, oh, it would be awesome. Um, I'm like aware of that. I just like, I can't even, uh, it's one more, one more variable that, um, makes my head spin a little bit. Um, no, I'd be I'm, I'm just making you crazy. I'm just excited. No, no, I love it. I mean, it's, I think, you know, that's I think, why we invited Seva. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, I mean, I'm, I'm really curious. I, I could honestly, I could see it going different ways for different crops. Like now that you're saying it out, now that we're like actually doing, I'm like where, where it could actually be super valuable is in looking at what nutrients the clover is actually better at stealing than the cash crop, if that makes sense. Um, like you might find that the, who the hell knows? <laughs> it's all so complicated. I mean, that's, what's exciting about it, but like it's also interesting. You might find, I don't know, there's like not that much zinc in X, Y, or Z because the clover more aggressively forages for that. Um, but I assume there'd be good nutrient density overall only because it's like a very complex system. Um, no, it would be cool. I don't know if, if you have, what's his name? Um, what's his name? Nutrient density guy? Dan, Dan. Um... Kittredge. Kittredge. Jeez. Um, if you know, I don't know him. If you know him and you want to put us in touch, I am joking that it's driving me crazy. It's like, it's all interesting. I definitely would like, I would pursue it. I'm interested in it. I don't have connections like that, but uh, uh, I think he'd be really interested. And also cool. they have funding. I'm just curious how this all overlaps. Uh, maybe. Uh, maybe, maybe. Thanks. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. All right. Any final questions? And you should all have uh, that email that Lincoln shared as a way to get directly in touch. Yeah, um, PCS Farm Partner at Gmail. PCS, like Perennial Clover System, PCS Farm Partner at Gmail. I'm going to uh, put that right into the chat here. That's a good idea. Uh, so don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, and I hope to see all of you on July 20th at the farm. Uh, so Lincoln, thanks so much for sharing this. It's clear this is a, a labor of love and, and exasperation and success. <laughs> and it's really great to hear from a farmer who's doing so much innovation, which is clearly something that we need urgently. So uh, thanks again for taking the time to put your, you know, your work together in the way that you did. Um, yeah, and, thank um, you, Stephen and Molly, for putting these on. This is very cool. This is what we need more of. So thank you guys. I appreciate it. And thanks to everybody for showing up to this very uh, specific little uh, talk. <laughs> this is great. I hope to talk to all of you more. All right. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, thanks for coming. Thank you. Everyone. Good night. Bye. Lincoln, I will be speaking with you soon to follow up. All right, cool. Good night. Good night.